Okay, we are live and recording. Thank you all and welcome to our virtual training, Applying U.S. National Grid for Decision Support in Search and Rescue. My name is Paul Doherty, and I am the lead for Search and Rescue GIS at the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, or NAPSIG for short. My experience using Master Search and Rescue, or SAR, began as a ranger and geographic information specialist in Yosemite National Park several years ago. And this has been my passion ever since. I'm here with Brian Emberg, the Director of Education with the National Association for Search and Rescue. Good evening, Brian. Good, e good evening. So, uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining this WebEx. Uh, most of you are already familiar with NASAR. Uh, for those who aren't, we are an international higher education organization uh, for, that offers education, certification, publication, and advocacy for SAR professionals. Uh, we realize that the ability to quickly, accurately collect and display and share information during a search and rescue response is absolutely critical to the effective and efficient management of a search and rescue mission. We must be able to apply precise location data, not just to intelligence information to direct us to our subject, but as well as crew location to ensure accountability and safety. This can be challenging these days as there's an ever-growing pile of paper and digital GIS resources, all using multiple different datums and coordinate uh, languages. To establish a shared picture in an incident, we must embrace the shared geospatial coordinate reference system. That is U.S. National Grid. That's why we're here today. You can expect to see a lot more U.S. National Grid material in all future location, uh, future offerings from the National Association for Search and Rescue. Next slide. Great. Thank, thank you, Brian. Uh, and NASIG is very proud to, uh, to be partnering with NASAR on this initiative. NASIG has a mission to equip emergency management and public safety with knowledge, skills, and resources to apply decision support technology, primarily in this case, geospatial decision support tool. Virtual trainings like this one is one way we support this mission. The search and rescue community is critical to this mission, and we intend to increase our support for search and rescue in 2016, starting with the establishment of the NAPSIG Foundation SAR Working Group. NAPSIG was founded with support and guidance from an alliance of the major national public safety associations who are committed to working together in partnership for the purpose of enhancing our ability to protect our citizens. NASIC's been around for nearly 10 years, and we are a 501c3 not-for-profit, and we're led by a governing board of directors that's comprised of public safety practitioners from across the nation. This recent par partnership with the National Association for Search and Rescue is very exciting, and this virtual training is our first event together. So, Brian, why are these two organizations here today? What are we here to learn? Our purpose today, Paul, is to gain hands-on skills for using the U.S. National Grid as a point and area reference system that provides actionable location information in a uniform format, to highlight best practices and lessons learned from field responders, and to achieve a consistent situational awareness across SAR teams and multiple agencies during an incident. Next slide. Our training objectives today are to learn how to apply a U.S. National Grid-enabled decision support uh, tools to enhance coordination during SAR operations, to gain insights from real-world incidents where U.S. National Grid was successfully used to support SAR operations, to explore the use of U.S. National Grid and GIS in search and rescue operation workflows, and to learn about the suite of U existing U.S. National Grid and GIS decision support tools that are already available. So, before we get going, here's some key terminology. When we refer to the U.S. National Grid, or USNG, we're referring to a common location, area, and point reference language for ground and ground-to-air operations. When we refer to geographic information systems, or GIS, we're referring to a system designed to capture, store, manipulate, analyze, manage, and present all types of spatial or geographic data. Really, a simpler definition is data that you can see on a map. When we use the word SAR today, we're referring generally to the search and rescue and provision of aid to people who are in distress or imminent danger. 
We recognize that U.S. National Grid will apply to each subdiscipline or operation in different ways. But using U.S. National Grid as our location language will increase our interoperability. Just as a reminder before we continue, slides will be made available after the presentation. And type your questions in and we'll review at the end of the Q&A session. Next slide. The way we're going to tackle our training objectives today is by looking at the U.S. National Grid from three distinct viewpoints. We're going to learn how to apply U.S. National Grid as a point reference, and this will form the foundation for our understanding of this coordinate system. We'll then move on to using U.S. National Grid as an area of reference. And then finally, we'll support all of this, uh, the use of U.S. National Grid, through a short demonstration on how U.S. National Grid can be used for decision support. Search and rescue, or SAR, whether urban or wildland, is an inherently spatial problem. Therefore, effectively, communica effectively communicating location is paramount. Yet, many search and rescue teams are not using the geospatial tools needed in large-scale disaster on a day-to-day -day basis. There is often inconsistent and insufficient use of U.S. National Grid and location-enabled decision support tools. Maps may exist, but are not necessarily effective in mission-critical decision-making. And overall, this leads to a lack of interoperability. For example, how many of you have heard a phrase like this before? The decimal degree coordinates may have been entered into a software interface box for degree minute seconds. I think that, in my experience, there are countless uh, incidents where ineffectively communicating location through coordinates has it led to a delay or incorrect response. You'll see here a link on the slides for more stories like this one. The solution is straightforward, and we hope to leave you convinced of this by the end of this session. Use U.S. National Grid every day in training and for operations. And get to know your local GIS specialists from the Wildland Fire Incident Management Team, State EOC, County Parcel Office, or County OEM. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but you can visit the NAFTA Regional Leadership Team website where you can find GIS specialists that specialize in public safety in your community. Okay, so now let's dive into why agencies are using U.S. National Grid. Well, first of all, U.S. National Grid provides a unified language for defining areas of interest, reporting, planning, and navigation. It helps us transform data to actionable information in a uniform format. It provides a consistent situational awareness across jurisdictions, disciplines, and all levels of operation. It also provides interoperability in both the connected and disconnected environment. The U.S. National Grid is used by FEMA Urban Search and Rescue Teams. You see here in uh, the more tornado in particular, uh, task force teams were using U.S. National Grid. The U.S. National Grid can be readily adopted by all search and rescue teams, especially those that are already using UCMs, for instance, mountain rescue teams or teams that are working in wilderness areas. And remember, U.S. National Grid will be used on all large-scale disasters and will be an indispensable tool for communicating location across jurisdictions and operations, such as in the picture here in the Colorado floods where we have military, urban search and rescue, and even wildland search and rescue teams cooperating together. Finally, nearly every after-action report posts large-scale or regional disaster clearly indicates the need for a common grid reference system. This goes all the way back to Hurricane Andrew and many disasters ever since. Furthermore, if you show up on a large incident with multiple agencies, you can expect to see U.S. National Grid. It's already a standard. So let's begin. What do we mean by using the U.S. National Grid as a point reference system? Cole Brown from the Maryland State Police Special Operations Division is going to explain 
using U.S. National Grid as a point reference tool. He has had great success in implementing the U.S. National Grid in the day-to-day -day operations environment. Thanks, Cole. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. I'm Cole Brown, and I've been in search management for missing persons with law enforcement for nearly 25 years, an instructor for NASAR for 20 years, served as a state SAR coordinator's counsel for 15 years, and have assisted on the National Search and Rescue Committee Correspondence and Georeference Working Group. I've been using U.S. National Grid for 11 years, but the actual system is the military grid reference, which dates back to the mid-1940s. This is a tested system for over 65 years. Next slide. So why do we use U.S. National Grid as a point reference? To start with, it doesn't make a difference what environment you're in or the type of incident that you're on. For example, a search team needs to direct a rescue team into an unfamiliar area or an area that has no street signs, or if advising command where a clue or subject is located. That is when a common location language is needed the most no matter if it is a disaster area or if it's in the middle of a wilderness. Next slide. The U.S. National Grid is not hard to learn or implement. If you're using UTM or Universal Transverse Mercator, this should be easily, uh, especially easy for you. The military has in fact been using the military grid reference system for nearly 70 years when it was implemented in 1949. In an article in Military Engineering in 1951 by Jacob Scope, he said, it supplies a simple yet unique identification for any point on the Earth. Now, let me talk a little bit about some of the success stories that we've had. In Maryland, our search and rescue teams have been using the Universal Transfer Mercator or UTM, for 30-plus years. And since MGRS and USNG are based on UTM, it was an easy transition since they were already truncating the coordinates to an eight-digit grid. Four of those coordinates to the right representing east and four up representing north. We then provided them a map of Maryland with a 100,000 meter grid square ID and grid zone designator for the search managers to incorporate on the task assignment sheets and the maps, which then completed the complete U.S. National Grid coordinate. The second success story was the fire company in which I belong to, Hampstead Volunteer Fire Company, who began using U.S. National Grid. They were transitioning their maps, and it was decided to ensure that the maps were compliant with the FEMA GIS standards with U.S. National Grid and longitude and latitude coordinates and grids on the sides of the map and ensure that the maps were to scale. Teaching the members of the fire company was very easy, especially with GPS apps on their phones has proven very beneficial. Next slide. So let's get started. The U.S. National Grid has three major components. It is always read, read up, read write, then up. So we always, you'll hear this term used over and over, read write, then up. So each component has its own right, which represents east, and its up, which represents north. So what makes up the three components of the U.S. National Grid coordinate? First, let's start with the grid zone designation. The 18 is the six degree zone, and the S is the eight degree latitude band. We'll get into more detail here in a few minutes. 100,000 meter square ID, the next section, this is the main difference between U.S. National Grid and Military Grid Reference from UTM. These are alpha letters that relate to the UTM 100,000 meter representing East for U and to the north J. These will change, these alpha letters will change, but this is what the UJ represents. 
the grid coordinates with the grids within that square is the eight digit grid with four digits of 2337 to the east, representing right, and 0651 to the north, representing up. This was truncated to a 10 meter square or an area of 32 foot by 32 foot. Jared will discuss later on how to use U.S. National Grid for an area of reference in search and rescue operations. Next slide. So let's talk about our grid zone designation first. This is the six degrees by eight degree longitudinal and latitudinal band. As we discussed earlier, 18 represents the 18th easting zone, which with each zone being six degrees each. The first zone starts at the international date line, which is 180 degrees west. Each zone is numbered and increases going east or to the right. The 18th zone starts at 78 degrees west longitude and ends at 72 degrees west longitude. The S is the eight degree latitude band going north or up from 80 degrees south latitude starting with the letter C. Latitude band S starts at 32 degrees north and ends at 40 degrees north latitude. Next slide. The grid zone designation. Here's a map of the United States with the grid zone designation. So the United States is within the zones 10 through 19, and the latitude bands are through you. Remember, the system is for the entire world, excluding the polar regions. As you can see, there is a connection here with latitude and longitude because the Universal Transverse Mercator, or UTM, is based on latitude longitude and latitude, as well as the military grid reference and, uni and U.S. national grid systems. They're interrelated, but the big difference is that U.S. national grid allows us to measure distance and area on the ground without any special calculations or tools. This is extremely simple but powerful capability that differentiates it from longitude and latitude without losing the reference to longitude and latitude. Before we move on, I had a great question pop up here. And the question came from somebody that said, why does CAP still use longitude and latitude versus U.S. National Grid? And are there any plans to get Civil Air Patrol and the Air Force Rescue Coordination Center to move over to U.S. National Grid? Well, to answer that question, I can tell you that the Civil Air Patrol has been teaching at their uh, annual National Emergency Services Academy, UTM, for almost over 10 years, and for the past four years have been using, teaching U.S. National Grid for ground search and rescue operations. Remember, in the Landsar Addendum and the Catastrophic Incident for Search and Rescue Addendum, in the georeferencing section, there's a georeferencing matrix which states that during a SAR operations for land SAR ops, the primary system is U.S. National Grid, and the secondary uh, system is latitude and longitude in the format of degrees, minutes, decimal minutes. And if SAR operations is in aeronautical operations, then the primary is longitude and latitude in the format of degrees, minutes, decimal minutes, and the secondary is U.S. National Grid. So these systems are very interchangeable. Next slide. Here is a state map of Virginia showing a 100,000 meter square grid for the entire state. This is the main and only difference of U.S. National Grid from UTM. 
If you're using the full UTM coordinate, the easting coordinate without truncating the coordinate at the equator goes from 167,000 meters to 833,000 meters to the east for each six degree zone. The northern coordinate without truncating goes from zero to 10 million meters from the equator to the North Pole, which creates an additional digit. So to simplify this, we're using single alpha letters. These le alpha letters then relate to the UTM, 100,000 meters to the east, representing U, and to the north, represented by J. The letters change every 100,000 meters. This system this letter system was designed in 1942 by the Corps of Engineers of the U.S. Army. Most importantly is to obtain a state map with your grid zone designator and 100,000 meter grid zones from, for your response area. Next slide. Here's an example for the state of Maryland where the alpha letters that relate to the 100,000 meters show you the U and the J and how they change as they go across. So important is to check with your local GIS specialist to see if they can give you a designated map for your response area. Next slide. The design of the 100,000 meter alpha letter square ID is organized so only that it only repeats every 18 degrees east and north, which is about 1,000 miles in mid-latitude. This illustration depicts how far one must go until the letters UJ repeat. This ensures a given value such as UJ2337 by 0651 is unique throughout the entire state it's located in as well as the surrounding state. Next slide. A USNG enabled map, especially those derived from the Federal Geographic Data Committee standard, will always provide a grid reference box showing the grid zone, 18S, and the 100,000 meter square ID. Now enough of the details, so let's take a look at how we're going to read these coordinates and obtain the coordinates from a map. We have already determined from our map that we're in the grid zone of 18S UJ. So unless we move outside of this grid zone, it does not need to be reported and it can be truncated to an eight or 10 digit grid based on the need for accuracy. Once we have identified a grid zone on a meter, we need to now identify the coordinate, how they are broken down and how we see them on a thousand meter map. So here we have the uh, meters broken down and as you can see going to the east, you have 22, 23, and 24 and they're 1,000 meter blocks. Going up, you have 05, 06, and 07. So when we look at the coordinates, always remember that the coordinates that are going to be provided to you have to be an even number digit. Example is 2337 0651. Just remember that this is based on the metric system, which is a based on the units of 10. I will explain this once we get into a practice together. Next slide. So here's our first set of coordinates. This has been truncated to an eight digit grid, which is 2337 by 0651. So we'll take the first section of numbers, which is the 2337, and we will read right from the 23 grid line, and then we will move over an additional 370 meters or what we look at is four-tenths of the way between 23 and 24. 
Next slide. We'll take the 0651. We're going to read up starting at grid zone number six. Then we're going to measure another 510 meters up or halfway between the two to get our cross intersection numbers. Next slide. So as we discussed earlier about the full UTM coordinate, they're shown here at the bottom and left side of the maps. The 10,000 and 1,000 meter values in the UTM coordinate are known as our principal digits in the U.S. National Grid coordinate. So UTM and U.S. National Grid are fundamentally similar in how they work. We just read them differently. As you can see is that the UTM superscript numbers, four at the bottom, represents D, and then the 44 on the side equals E. As you can see in the middle of the map here, or to the lower right-hand side, it says 13T DE. So by ignoring them, we can now just do our eight-digit grid. Another good question has been uh, presented here regarding the differences between an eight-digit grid and a 10-digit grid accuracy. And why, didn't, why don't we always use a 10-digit grid coordinate? Well, first, let me explain the differences. The first is the 10-digit grid coordinate will get you within one meter or within a three-foot by three-foot box. An eight-digit grid, as we discussed earlier, will get you into a 10-meter box or 32 by 32-foot area. Most importantly is that on a map of a scale of 1 to 24,000, you will not be able to get down to the precise 10-digit grid, so it's truncated to a 10-meter or a 8-digit grid. Next slide. Now, most importantly here, the U.S. National Grid always uses NAD 83 or North American Datum 1983 or its equivalent WGS 1984 as its map datum. No exceptions, so you don't have to worry about it. Your GPS receiver or smartphone will default to these map datums. If you're using it, Old maps that have NAD 27, that is a different story and will not be discussed in detail today. In short, you may have to get with your GIS specialist to have them make maps that are in NAD 83 or WGS 1984. Now, as you can see here, that the only difference between MGRS and USNG is that MGRS uses world uh, WGAS 84 and U.S. National Grid defaults to NAD 83. These systems are equivalently the same at scale smaller than 1 to 5,000. Next slide. Paul? All right. Well, thank you, Cole. That was a really, I think, effective ex explanation of how the U.S. National Grid works. Remember, this isn't the information that's going to be going through your head during a disaster, but it gives you a good background so you understand the system. With that being said, why don't we begin our first practice exercise together? Go ahead, Cole. Thanks, Thanks Paul. So here we have a m missing person reported, and the dispatcher gives you an address of 419 South Hawksville Road, Hampstead, Maryland, as the point last seen, and where the reporting party is missing. But as we go to this location, it takes us to the mail mailbox for this address. Good thing that we have, been pre we have prepared a USNG-enabled map book. We've been uh, provide you a copy of this map book page to this exercise. Go to the link uh, below, and this will be made available to you uh, for you to look at later. Next steps 
is to have the county provide you from the 911 center the U.S. National Grid coordinates from the teletype so that the U.S. National Grid information can be looked up. The ultimate objective here is to be precise with the location of where the actual caller is. In addition, our fire company, Hampstead Volunteer Fire Company, has built map books that have U.S. National Grid coordinates, and we're able to receive the U.S. National Grid coordinates um, and be able to have precise location. Next slide. So, again, what is the grid zone designation? What is the 100,000 meter square ID? Well, since the maps are designed correctly, if we look at the lower corner here, we can see that this is an 18S UJ. From there, we'll go to the next thing. We'll look at our coordinate. So we know that it's 18S UJ, and the coordinates are 39225 by 80497. So first, we need to do is look at the bottom of our map. We're going to read right first. We're going to look for 39. So we find the coordinate of 39. Next slide. And then we need to do is look for 225 meters. So we're going to do is go to the 200, which is the 200 meters, which is two tick marks over. Each of these tick marks down below here represent 100 meters each. Then we're going to go 25 meters over within that box, and that will give us a little bit more precise. Now let's work up. Next slide. We're going to look for our 80 thousand meters, which is going to be on the side. We have 80, 81, so we're going to start at 80. Next slide. And then we want to do is work up 400 meters or four tick marks up. Next slide. And then from that point is we're going to go up another 97 meters within that uh, 100 zone block, and that will put, put us precisely at the house of 419. Next slide. You can also use a ruler, a, a book to draw your lines if it helps. To get a more precise coordinate, we can also um, estimate or use a standard map with its scales like the 1,000 or 1 to 6,000, 1 to 24,000. For extreme precision, you can use one of the Romer scales, which measures down to the meter in a map of 1 to 6,000. Next slide. Paul, you want to talk a little bit about GPS receivers and smartphones? Yes, and I think it's very important to have the foundation and how to use the paper map and U.S. National Grid. Um, but remember that no matter what device we're using, we can use U.S. National Grid. Most GPS receivers have U.S. National Grid or at least the military grid reference system enabled or, or possible to be enabled within their setting. We're going to cover this in a later training, so be sure to stay tuned. Remember that also other applications may use the U.S. National Grid. For today's exercise, we've created a web mapping application called the Hasty Mapper, and you'll see here there's a dialog box for entering U.S. National Grid. It has U.S. National Grid in the map as a layer and also has U.S. National Grid on the screen showing you where your mouse or where the center of your screen is. And this particular application can be used on any device with a web browser. There are other web mapping applications with U.S. National Grid enabled, such as this one at startopo.com. And another one with G for Math. That I really like the way the U.S. National Grid is labeled here on this application, so be sure to check out the GMAP4 web mapping application. And remember, there are other uh, really simple ways. It doesn't always have to be a map. This particular app at the usngapp.org will work on any device with a browser and simply tells you where your device at least thinks it is based off of the U.S. National Grid system. 
So remember, using the U.S. National Grid every day and for every operation is the best way to get comfortable with this system. And I think this USNG app is a great way to get started. Also, at the U.S. National Grid Center, you can download U.S. National Grid Ready Maps and map books for any point you see on the map. Just click on the map, on the Maps and Readers Map Books uh, tab here, and you'll see this interactive map where you can download map books for an area near, hopefully, for an area near you. The key takeaway here is that responders should be able to access a quick U.S. National and Grid Ready Map as soon as they have incident information. We understand they can't wait around for a GIS specialist. That's why your map should be ready to go ahead of time. Now let us turn to the next topic, U.S. National Grid for area reference. Remember how you use U.S. National Grid may differ between the type of operation, but it's important to understand the concept for disaster operations. I'd like to introduce Jared Doak from the Kansas GIS response team. Jared is a GIS specialist, but also a first responder. Jared's worked on quite a few fire trucks and was actually an intern of mine. <laughs> Yosemite National Park together. Jared recently completed his thesis, Analysis of Search Incidents and Lost Person Behavior in Yosemite National Park. So thank you, Jared, for joining us. Thank you for that introduction, Paul. So I think that one of the most overlooked benefits of U.S. National Grid is the fact that it can be used not only as a point reference system, but as an area reference system as well. So an incident commander needing to break a large incident perimeter into manageable parts can do so using U.S. National Grid so the operational areas can be clearly defined and communicated easily across multiple disciplines and jurisdictions. Next slide. So you may be wondering what we mean by an area reference. Uh, what we mean by that is that coordinates can represent not only a point on the map, but a geographic area as well. And the precision of the coordinates determines the size of that area. So this is similar to latitude, longitude, decimal degrees, except for in this case, we actually know the level of precision we are talking about because U.S. National Grid is based on the meter. So you can see several examples uh, here below. And so if the precision is four digits. Uh, we know that the area is a little over uh, half a mile. If it's six digits, it would be about the size of a football field, and 10 digits is down to one square meter. So you want to remember when working with these coordinates, we always use an even number of digits, and you should ask for clarification if you're given otherwise. Next slide. And since U.S. National Grid is so flexible for determining area reference, we can use it to define scalable operational areas. So at the most basic level, we have tactical areas of operation, which can be designated by one or more 1,000-meter grid squares, and these provide detailed information for direct tactical operations. Next, regional operational areas are generally designated by 10,000-meter grid squares. And finally, at the strategic level, 100,000-meter grids, which are utilized by plan for planning purposes by officials at the State Emergency Operations Center. And you should remember that for some operations, the 100-meter grids might be more appropriate for tactical area assignment. And this can be determined based on the number of resources available and the task at hand, such as building searches or evidence searches. And because U.S. National Grid is our common language, it can easily be used as an operational planning tool. And as we'll show you later, provide the framework for more in-depth spatial analysis. And Jared, that brings up a good point about the type of operation you're doing. Uh, he mentioned there that sometimes we'll use a 100-meter grid for some of the uh, more densely populated areas. Another caveat, uh, something that's been brought up in some of our Q&A, is that it's not always appropriate to create grid-based grid -based assignments. This is especially the case in uh, missing person search operations in the wilderness environment, where searching for missing persons on the ground we might be better off using, you know, a regular features on the landscape, things that we can see in the field. There may be barriers or other features in the landscape that simply do not allow for this type of grid search. 
But remember, we can still use a U.S. national grid as our location language for record, reporting things like clues or operational assets. You're not forced to use the grid as your assignment area. But remember, during large-scale disasters, even some of the readily recognizable things we're used to seeing every day, like roads and power lines, may be totally absent from, the, from what we're seeing in the real world. So that would be a great time to bring the U.S. national grid back into your operation. So thanks, Jared, for that quick overview of using U.S. National Grid as an area of reference. Let's get right into our second practice exercise. Jared will introduce the scenario, and you can follow along on the screen, or use the web mapping application at home using the link below. All right. So for this scenario, at 2132 hours on Saturday, May 21st, 2016, Manhattan, Kansas takes a direct hit from an EF5 tornado. Incident resources from the south are meeting near City Park, and given that they may have been, there may be other tornadoes across the Midwest, we need to think strategically. So using the Hasty web map where we are going to determine what our 100,000 meter grid zone designator is for this tornado, what our 10,000 meter grid area is, and then our tactical area uh, for City Park, which is the 1,000 meter grid. Next slide. Great. So what you'll see here is a web mapping application that can be used to understand these different area references. So you can search for Manhattan, Kansas up in the upper left corner, and you can very quickly see that it, Manhattan falls within one forest here to affect Juliet. And most local responders, responders will already be familiar with this information. And if we zoom in a little bit farther, uh, we can see that uh, Manhattan is within the grids Quebec Juliet 03, 04, and 14. And if we zoom in again, we can see that City Park, our initial rally point, is within the 1,000 meter zone of zero niner three niner great thanks Sarah. that was a really uh helpful demonstration of how the area grid reference system works sure and we'll uh, quickly go over our answers again so in the matter of seconds you can see that our 100,000 meter grid zone designator is 14 Sierra Quebec Juliet. 10,000 meter grids are Quebec Juliet 040314. And our 1,000 meter grid for City Park is 0939. Great. And that's a, a really nice reminder of how to communicate over the radio. Uh, and using US National Grid, it, it may be helpful to use alphanumerics to uh, indicate the letters there. So thanks for that reminder, Jared. Remember, regardless of what type of application we're using, the U.S. National Grid will work as our, our location language. So this leads us to the last component of our training, using U.S. National Grid for decision support. So why use U.S. National Grid for decision support? Well, pre-incident planning and analysis can be used to determine potential resource needs and to facilitate mutual aid coordination and deployment. What do I mean by that? I mean investing time into planning prior to an incident and using that as a force multiplier during times of disaster. Here, in this example, we're talking about having pre-scripted missions where we can take data like demographics, community lifelines, such as transportation, communications, and energy facilities, and our critical facilities like police stations, fire stations, hospitals, and schools. We know where these locations are, and they're stored in geographic information systems. If we can basically count the number of these within each U.S. national grid ahead of time, when the disaster or our exercise occurs, we can overlay the incident data to calculate these numbers very quickly. 
here in Florida, for any given 1,000-meter grid, they know exactly what critical facilities are there. So when an incident occurs, they can simply overlay that forecast or actual impact data, and they can begin preparations and understand the impact in advance. This topic could be covered in much greater detail, and we can follow up with another session if people are interested. For more information on this concept, the prescripted mission, you can see the link here below. Now let's apply U.S. National Grid for decision support in our scenario from before. Go ahead, Jared. All right, so as responders arrive on scene, more information starts coming in. Structures along the center of the path incurred incredible damage. Facilities impacted include, but are not limited to, countless single-family residences, multi-unit student housing complexes, Kansas State University, Via Christi Hospital, several public schools, and a fire station. Local emergency resources have become overwhelmed, and multiple Kansas USAR task forces have been deployed to assist in search and rescue operations. So with this information, we have some critical questions that we need to answer, including how many people live in our impact area, and how do we prioritize tactical areas, and where would you send resources first? I mean, it wouldn't make sense to send the first search squad on scene to a sparsely populated outskirts of Manhattan when they could be greater utilized in an area more inhabited by more people. All right, and because we've already pre-scripted our 1,000-meter grids in this area, we can use a tool like this Impact Summary app to apply U.S. National Grid for decision support. So here on the left, you can see an interactive legend that tells, tells us where most densely populated areas are. And on the map itself, you can see where the critical infrastructure is. So you can see where the fire departments are and the schools, hospitals, et cetera. And in the boxes below, we have the total values for our impact area. So approximately 31,000 people live in this area. There are approximately 13,000 housing units that could be affected, 368 mobile home, homes, and a, and a little more than 700 businesses. If we click on the number of boxes, we get more information, like where our vulnerable populations are. So if we click on the grid square 1042, I can see the number specifically for that area. Great. Thank you, Jared. I think that, you know, a simple web mapping application like this can go a long way during disaster. And remember, we're able to do this because we have prescribed missions. The numbers, the demographics, all the information is already stored in these boxes. And when we overlay the disaster or the impact area, we can quickly run these calculations and make it available for decision makers and responders. So, Jared, so let's go to, ahead and review our answers. Yeah, to quickly review uh, how many people live in our area, uh, approximately 31,000 people, again, 13,000 housing units, uh, almost 400 mobile homes, and a little over 700 businesses. And how do we prioritize these tactical areas, and where do we send resources first? That would probably mostly be the high-density areas of population, perhaps areas with uh, infrastructure that's mostly affected, such as areas with mobile homes, or it could be the vulnerable populations, such as areas with a high senior population. And using Thank the you, information Jared. for our sure. <laughs> Go ahead, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. So using the information through our prescriptive mission analysis, we can see the numbers on the map and begin making informed decisions. And you can see how US National Grid is more than just a point and area reference system. Thank you. And I, I was gonna add there, this might be a new concept for many of you. And if you're not a GIS specialist, or even if you are, you might be wondering how can we begin this process? We'd like to have that conversation and, and perhaps even present this in future training. So please let us know if you are interested in this topic.
with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Brian and just maybe close out here and, and cover what we learned today. Sure. Cole, Jared, uh, Paul, thank you all for helping to explain how U.S. National Grid is more than just a point reference system. We hope that these short presentations and exercises were helpful in getting these points across. The U.S. National Grid provides a unified language for area of interest or area of responsibility reporting, planning, and navigation. It transforms data into actionable information in a uniform format. It is a consistent situational awareness tool across jurisdictions, disciplines, and all levels of operation. Lastly, it provides interoperability in both a connected and disconnected environment. Next slide. We hope the solution to the location language challenge is clear. We need to start using U.S. National Grid every day in all our training and all of our operations. We need to get to know our local GIS specialists from the Wild and Fire Incident Management teams, state and county EOCs, and we need to work on developing our own internal resources. Exactly. And as we mentioned earlier, there's a strong public safety GIS community out there who can help you. We at the NAPSIC Foundation and our partners at NASAR and also the Mountain Rescue Association are committed to helping you connect with GIS regional leadership teams. If you go to this link below, you'll see a list of some of the public safety GIS specialists in your area. And really, the SAR community is key to all disaster response and life-saving missions. So we're happy that there's now more support than ever for the search and rescue community. Here are some specific links where you can get in more in-depth training on U.S. National Grid during your free time. The materials we presented today are in this interactive gallery. And a video, uh, a, a short video on land navigation, Unit 12 of the National Park Service training, I find is especially helpful for helping search and rescue teams round out some of their land navigation and readily available to you today. But remember, it's important to incorporate U.S. National Grid into existing training and exercises. You can expect to see more U.S. National Grid in our future NASAR course offerings as well. This will increase interoperability across all NASAR members and meet the standards set by the National Search and Rescue Committee. Thank you all again for joining us. Thank you. And before we address some of our questions, we'd really uh, like to take a moment to thank the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Search and Rescue Working Group for their, for their help in connecting us with all of you here today. And we'd like to thank the following people for providing content and guidance on, on this particular training. So we had a few questions come up. One of them is, can I use my handheld GPS unit with U.S. National Grid? And the answer is most likely, especially a Garmin unit. And if for some reason U.S. National Grid doesn't show up in your setting, you can always use MGRF. Remember that you have to change both the position format and make sure the map datum is NAT83 or WGS 1984. We're going to cover this topic in more detail in our March uh, 2016 training, so, so stay tuned and make sure you sign up for that. Another question that came up is NAT83 and WS84 really the same thing? Well, as Cole mentioned, they are functionally equivalent for search and rescue purposes. If you, the map on the screen shows you some of the differences, which is four feet in this western region of the U.S. and two feet over here in Florida. Effectively, in a search and rescue mission, unless you're doing some kind of fine scale uh, evidence search, this does not matter. Furthermore, the, uh, the error between these two datums is probably uh, less than the error on your GPS that you're using. But remember, that's between 983 and 19, WGS 1984. When we talk about NAD27, that's really a whole other can of worms is a much larger error. So be sure to make sure that your datum is set to one of these two systems. That's a good point, Paul, you bring up is in regard to that um, getting with your GIS specialist or getting uh, a software that puts the map into, you know, WGS 84 or NAT 83 is critical um, because if you uh, are trying to report a clue or trying to get a team to you and you're reporting it in NAT 27, 
it could take them a while to get to you. Great. And then as Cole brought up before, the answer to this question, do I have to abandon latitude and longitude? No, we absolutely recommend you're literate in both systems. Many land maritime systems uh, or, or air operations still use latitude and longitude. Math and software should include options for both, but be clear on how you communicate and set these standards ahead of time on your incident or ahead of your incident and make sure it's known to everyone involved. For yeah, more Paul, information on that, I would say, yeah, yeah, uh, as, yeah go ahead. Yeah, Paul is going to say is it is critical on how you communicate and making sure that you um, communicate the words degrees, minutes, and decimal minutes and the decimal point that's in there um, is very critical because it could, you know, cause uh, a delay in the response. And the same thing is, is that these systems are interrelated uh, with each other. Exactly. So don't throw out everything you've already learned about latitude and longitude, but recognize that U.S. National Grid is, is recommended as a, as a standard and is already used by FEMA for all of their operations. With that, thank you all for uh, attending this video. This is a second recording due to a problem with our initial recording, but we hope that we address some of the questions and answers uh, some of the question and uh, Q&A panel questions that came up during the original recording. Thank you all for your patience and I look forward to seeing you during the next training. All right, Jared, Cole, Brian. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to hit the uh, stop recording button.